Hi, I'm Jeremy, the Zoom Nerd, coming to you live from my backyard in beautiful Los Angeles, California. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties with connection, so I ended what I had started and we will start anew. And hopefully the connection on this side is a little bit better. Uh, today for Monkey Monday, we are going to talk about the largest of all monkey species. Uh, last week on Monday, we talked about the smallest of monkeys with the pygmy marmoset being the smallest. If you missed that episode, you can always go back and rewatch that on YouTube, on Facebook, or on Instagram. It should be uploaded to all of those. And I have now launched Zoonerd, the website. Uh, I'll put links up later today on the Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. So you can always go there if you missed anything or want to rewatch it. But today for Monkey Monday, we are going to talk about the largest of all monkeys. Today, we're talking about mandrills. Mandrills are a very large monkey. If you saw the photo I posted earlier today on Instagram or Facebook, um, they are distinct in their bright coloration on their faces. That is a male mandrill. Um, I can easily tell them apart at quick glance uh, based on their size and the shape of their face. Uh, males are about twice the size of the females. If that monkey seems familiar to you, you may have seen it uh, in a zoo in the United States or elsewhere in the world. Um, but you may also know a cartoon version of that monkey uh, called Rafiki from Disney's The Lion King. Uh, Disney took some creative license in making Rafiki a mandrel um, that would live in the savanna area near lions and zebras and many of those other animals. And that's not quite where they live. Uh, they live more in the rainforest section of Africa, specifically in Western Africa over near the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in the countries of Cameroon, Gabon, and Equatorial Guiana. Uh, those areas typically have a very large, dense uh, tropical rainforest uh, where little light reaches the ground level. And mandrels as a species typically spend most of their daytime hours on the ground foraging or looking for their food. So they eat a wide variety of different things. Um, they are considered omnivores, which means they'll eat a little bit of everything, kind of opportunistic. Whatever they can find, they will happily eat. Uh, they eat a lot of fruits, seeds, and nuts, but they will also eat insects, um, small mammals, some birds, eggs, uh, small lizards that they may find and there's documented cases of them going after small forest antelope called dikers. So occasionally they will go after something almost the same size as them, although that's kind of rare. They're not typically big meat eaters, but they'll take advantage of it if the opportunity arises. Now in their forest home, they have these bright colors on their faces and also on their rear ends. Uh, the males are brighter colored than the females but they have bright reds, blues, yellows, and purples, both on the front and on the back. And scientists figure that those colors help them to be able to see each other as they move through what can be a very dark and shadowy forest setting as they walk on all fours along the uh, forest floor looking for their food. Now they walk flat palmed on the, the ground. So um, great apes, when they walk on all fours, typically knuckle walk up on the edge of their hands. Uh, mandrels walk flat palmed uh, with their feet kind of all down on the ground. But they do spend most of their daytime hours on the ground. They'll go up into the trees, sometimes to look for specific food if there's fruit up there that they're aware of, um, or they'll sleep up in the trees because that's a little bit safer space for them uh, during the night. Um, and often they will follow other monkey species around who are already up in the trees. And as those monkeys eat things, they often drop things. Um, and the mandrels will make quick use of any of the food that drops down to the ground. Their bright colors also can intensify uh, based on their emotions. Um, so sometimes they can become even brighter uh, depending on how they're feeling and their mood. And uh, that is something that has been uh, studied and documented quite a bit with their bright colors. Now in their forest home, they typically live in family groups with a dominant male, um, several adult females, and then their offspring. 
and occasionally some like teenage um, boys that are hanging around or sometimes an older male who is no longer dominant but is allowed to kind of hang out on the edge of their family group. And that number of uh, individuals is sometimes like 10 to 12 or up to as many as like 20. Um, and sometimes it does have multiple males but always one who's kind of the boss and in charge of uh, the group and making the decisions for where they go as well as uh, being the primary breeder when it comes time to have more baby monkeys. Um, baby mandrels are super cute. They're born after a gestation or pregnancy of about six months, uh, specifically 179 to 182 days. Um, so it's a, a decent length gestation for the size of animal they are, but it's not overly long. Uh, it's also not super short. Um, babies are born between one and two pounds, usually just one baby. Twins have been documented, but it's pretty rare. And the babies hold on to their mom, usually on her belly right away um, as she moves about through the forest. Now, one thing I find super fascinating about mandrels is that they have built in pockets to store food uh, as they're going through their forest. That's uh, super helpful. If they feel threatened or endangered, they can certainly uh, load up their pockets with a bunch of food and then go to a safer place to kind of eat that food. But their pockets aren't here or here like humans have pockets. Their pockets are in their cheeks. So they have these nice little pouches on the side of their face inside their mouth um, where they can store food. Kind of like a hamster. If any of you have ever had hamsters as pets, you may be familiar with this. But mandrel cheek pouches, that's what they call them, cheek pouches. And they're not the only monkeys. There's other monkeys that have those too. But their cheek pouches are pretty significant. Um, during my time in working with mandrels, I uh, worked at the Phoenix Zoo uh, for quite a while in education. And part of my job when I was working in education was to talk about the mandrels there and to toss them food. And they would often be able to load up all the food that we tossed them into their cheek pouches within a minute or two and then slowly snack on that throughout the day. This kind of helped the ones who were more dominant get as much food as they wanted. Um, immediately and it was pretty impressive how much they could fit into their cheek pouches. At one point we tossed them whole mangoes, a big size fruit, um, and the big male mandrel put the whole mango into his cheek pouch and you could see it from the outside kind of just hanging there off the side of his face um, and then to get it out he just kind of pushed on it with his hand and out popped the entire whole mango still um, and then he took some time to like peel the the peel off and eat it later on uh, when there wasn't more food coming in and he was at a place where he felt safer to eat his food. Now in their dark forest, it's very important for mandrels to communicate with each other to kind of stay together as a group. So some of the ways that they do that, uh, I already mentioned their bright colors help them to see each other, um, but they'll also communicate through a series of different vocalizations. Um, most noticeably, they kind of make a screaming sound. Sounds very much like human screaming. Or they'll make uh, kind of grunt sounds as well. But they also communicate in other ways. One of which is that they can do some scent marking. Male mandrels have a scent gland in the middle of their chest. And they'll use that to kind of help scent mark through the trails if they're walking along. So the rest of the family can know where the leader is because he's at the front. Uh, those at the very back might have a hard time if they kind of get distracted or stop to eat food. They can kind of find their way using their sense of smell as well as listening for those vocal cues. But in addition to scent marking and vocal communication, they also do a lot of nonverbal communication. So uh, in the species of monkeys I've worked with, I found that mandrels are some of the most expressive with facial expression. Um, they can do a lot of different things and they frequently use facial expression to communicate a variety of things. So some of the things that they'll do is they'll make a grin like this and they kind of shake their heads when they do it. Um, the males in particular will do a yawn where they'll show their teeth and they have huge canine teeth. So these, the pointy teeth that we have kind of off on the corners of our front teeth 
their canine teeth are, can be two inches in length. That's as big as the canine teeth of um, a female lion or an adult male leopard. So those are really huge teeth. And the male mandrels will use those to defend their family and also sometimes to intimidate or threaten other males who may be coming in to try to breed uh, with any of their females. So they will yawn and show their teeth. They will also slap the ground, um, particularly if they're feeling threatened or if they're trying to intimidate uh, someone else. They'll slap and kind of give you a really intense stare. Uh, they communicate a lot with uh, eyes. They'll do a really intense stare. They'll kind of blink. They'll look away if they're a more submissive animal. But their uh, body language and their their facial expressions is very important to mandrels. And it was really fun during my time of uh, working with them at the Phoenix Zoo, being able to kind of learn what those different things meant and see how they interacted with me on a day-to-day -day basis as I came by and tossed them some fruits and veggies. Um, sometimes they would, uh, the lowest ranking one would threaten me all the time. She thought that that was really great. She was trying to make sure someone was lower ranking than her. And since they saw me almost every day, they, she wanted to make sure that I knew that she was above me in their social hierarchy. Um, it was really entertaining to watch her threaten me. Um, the big male would also threaten me quite a bit. That was uh, a little different emotion for me. I was very scared of him. Um, he was a big boy. He had real sharp teeth and he was kind of cranky. Uh, so he would often scare quite a few of us who kind of had my same position and would work around uh, the mandrels. He was pretty intimidating for sure. Uh, let's see, what else were we gonna talk about? Oh, so mandrels in the wild, in their rainforest home in Africa are listed as vulnerable to extinction. Um, they are facing a lot of threats right now um, with the biggest of those being habitat loss as their forest home is being cut down to make wood um, to grow crops and also roads and mining have caused a big problem. But as more people are moving further and further out into the forest, there's another problem that's now a big issue for mandrels and that is something called bushmeat. Um, traditionally, people in Africa have had kind of a hard time uh, raising animals or finding enough food at different times and many people often would go hunting in the forest to find food. And as the population of humans in Africa has grown, um, some of those traditions and even some of the like desires to eat animals from the forest has continued to the point that there are now restaurants in cities that specialize in selling um, animal meat from the forest. And mandrels, unfortunately, are one of the targeted species. And it's not always just people from Africa, but often tourists who visit Africa uh, visit these restaurants in some of the cities and help uh, fuel this ongoing crisis called the bush meat crisis. Um, there are many different types of animals that are targeted and struggle with population numbers because they are hunted almost on a commercial basis to supply meat to some of the restaurants back in the cities for bush meat. And that may seem something that's very foreign to us here in the United States, but it's actually a fairly common thing in most of the rest of the world to um, hunt and eat wild animals. But in parts of Africa, it has taken it to a new level of making it almost a commercialization of the hunting and the eating of them in, in like a restaurant setting. Now, Mandrel's closest relative is another large monkey that has a very similar body shape and kind of a very similar um, face in its structure, but different colors called the drill. Um, drills and mandrels are quite closely related and they're quite uh, distant related to other monkeys. So those two are close, but everybody else is kind of a distant cousin. Um, drills are very, very rare and are listed as endangered species, um, but uh, for the same reasons, for uh, deforestation, losing their habitat, and they are also eaten for the bushmeat trade. Um, both mandrels and drills live in some of the same area, but don't quite overlap. So the mandrels are a little further south. Um, the drills are up into Cameroon and into the country of Nigeria. 
and they are, like I said, listed as endangered, and uh, they actually have lost more habitat than the mandrels have, so they're even at bigger risk. Now, in working with um, several different monkeys over the years, uh, I mentioned at the Phoenix Zoo, I really enjoyed my opportunity to be involved with the mandrels. I was never their keeper, but I worked as an educator who tossed them food and talked about them every day. Um, one of the other things that was really great about their cheek pouches are very entertaining to us. Uh, they had, the keepers had given them some enrichment that they had clipped on with a carabiner, a little, um, kind of like a, a keychain. You may s use those or see them uh, out and about. But they had clipped a carabiner to hold some enrichment, a toy that they could kind of play with. And the one female mandrel had taken the carabiner off the toy and she kept that in her cheek pouch. And she would pull it out and play with it, but she refused to trade it back to her keepers for a very long time and would keep it in her cheek pouch for months at a time. Um, she kind of would hold it as a very special thing that she had and that the others in the group didn't have. And it was kind of interesting to watch how that impacted um, her status in the troop over the course of several months. The other mandrels would try to take that from her and she'd always pop it back into her, her cheek pouch when they would come near and then pull it out again and play with it um, when she felt that she was far enough away from them in their exhibit. Now to help out with some of the threats that mandrels and drills are facing over in Africa, there's um, some really great organizations who have done a lot of conservation, education, and rehabilitation for um, individual animals that had been captured for either pets or the bushmeat trade, and they're trying to reintroduce them out into the wild. One of those is called PASA, or the Pan-African Sanctuary Alliance. And they partner with a, an organization called the Limbe Wildlife Center that is in Cameroon, um, that has done some really amazing work in helping out these endangered species of monkeys and really helping the local people to kind of get a little more involved and aware of how special these monkeys are in this uh, unique forest area in these small countries of West Africa. I'll be sharing some more information about our special shout outs today up on the Facebook profile later on today, and more information about mandrels as well, including some pictures of a baby mandrel that was just announced for the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, they had baby mandrels during my time that I worked there. I never worked with the babies, or with the mandrels at the LA Zoo, um, but I did see the babies that were there while they were on exhibit, and they were super cute to uh, watch how they interacted with each other especially as they got a little older, maybe in that like almost year old range where they could interact and play with each other a little bit more. Uh, so they've now had babies again at LA and I'll be posting some photos that they, sh they have shared uh, later today. As always, feel free to like, follow, subscribe, and share any of the content from ZooNerd with any of your family or friends who you think might enjoy it across any of the platforms, uh, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube and my new Zoo Nerd website that is up where you can go back and check in on anything you may have missed or previous episodes of Critter Chat. They all live there as well as on YouTube. They're easy to find just under Zoo Nerd. Um, you can also use the hashtag Critter Chat to find them uh, if you can't find them specifically. So you can go back and watch. This is episode 63 of Critter Chat, so there is a lot of content out there. Um, yep. Yeah. And that's pretty much what I have to share today for Monkey Monday and talking about mandrels. So thank you for tuning in. And as always, take care of yourself, be happy, be healthy, and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.